This is a fair coin I'm holding. Just flipped it four times. What if I told you it came up heads, tails, tails, head, or maybe ta tails, tails, heads, tails? You probably say, well, that's about right. That's what we expect from randomness. But what if I told you that it came up heads, 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 heads? Probably go, eh? Well, might not be a fair coin. That might be biased, right? So let me start by, by clearing by clearing out this, uh, this misconception. So if we flip a, f uh, a fair coin just once, it has even odds of coming up heads or tails. If we do it twice, we multiply both of these heads and tails, we multiply them by two, we end up with four possible sequences. Do it one more time, the four grows to eight, and do it one more time, the eight grows to 16. Okay. Now, of these 16, some of them might look more random to you, the ones in the middle, and others might not look as random, the ones on top and the ones at the bottom. But if, if you think about the process where those sequences, the way these sequences were generated, it was flipping a fair coin four times. So all of these sequences have the same chance of coming up, one in 16. So this is a topic that I want to explore today the way that randomness manifests itself in nature might be different from the way that you and I think about randomness. And strangely enough, nature hasn't, got, hasn't given us any sort of reliable gut feeling to navigate in those situations. So my favorite example for that is when I walk to the casino. So let's imagine walking into the casino and walking up to the roulette table. There, they have those displays that show you which, of, which number came up the last couple of times. So in this particular case, 24 was the last number to come up. But as you observe, there was a run of six blacks. And then before that, there was red and black and red. But if you're like me, you have this very strong urge to bet on red, right? Because what you know is the reds and the blacks are supposed to balance. And how can they balance if red doesn't show up? Okay, so you place your money on red, and you would be wrong. Actually, this feeling is so strong that it has its own name. It's known as the gambler's fallacy. And it has its own Wikipedia page. Okay? So I guess in the universe of fallacies, you got it made when you have your own Wikipedia page. Okay? So what's going on here? There's two concepts that are brain intermingles. The one more trivial concept is just looking at the difference of the reds and the blacks. So in this case, eight blacks, two reds, a difference of six. The other concept is the one of the relative frequency. This is how often did things happen in ratio to um, how long the experiment was run. So eight blacks out of 10 runs means a relative frequency of 8 out of 10, or 80%. 2 out of 10, 20%. So the true mathematical fact is that the relative frequencies, they will go and converge towards 50%. So in this case, we start off at 80%. And if we do this more and more often, it's going to go down to 50% for the blacks. And we start off with 20% for the reds. It's going to go up 50%, and all the way to 50%. So that's, that's without question, that's a true mathematical fact. But the story that our brain constructs for us is that it says, well, that can't happen unless the difference goes to zero. So in this case, the difference is six. And our brain says, the reds have to catch up because the difference has to be zero. That's not true. Let me show you. So I used a computer to simulate uh, 100 spins of the wheel. Turned out 56 to 44, and I give you two, numer uh, two graphical representations of the two concepts that I just introduced. The blue bar that grows horizontally represents the absolute difference, so that represents a length of 12 whatever units. The two vertical bars, they're the relative frequencies. So one is 56% high, 
the other is 44% high. So there's a small difference between the height of those two bars. If I run this experiment not 100 times, but 1,000 times, let's say we get 513 blacks or so. You can observe the difference increasing from 12 to 26, but the relative frequency drops from 56% to, what is it, 51.3% for the blacks and corresponding for the reds. And we can keep on going. For 10,000 rolls of the uh, spins of the roulette wheel, we get this. So the absolute difference, as you can see, is now about five times as large as it was before. And the relative frequency has gone down and is pretty close to 50-50. With 100,000, the absolute difference is enormous. So it's four times as large as it was before. And the relative frequency to the naked human eye seems to be about 50-50 in that visualization you see there. Right? So the brain confused two concepts and made up the story that the absolute difference has to go all the way down to zero, but it doesn't. Okay? So there's no, no real contradiction. It's just that our brain thinks that there might be a contradiction. Okay. So since I'm not in the habit of, of routinely carrying roulette tables to my lectures, I usually do an experiment just involving a coin to convince my students of different sorts of patterns in, in, in randomness. I would tell one of my students to take out a coin and flip it 100 times and write down the very sequence of heads, tails, tails, heads that that produces. And some other student, I tell, just make up the numbers. Just go heads, tails, tails, heads, tails in your head and do that until you get to 100 imaginary flips of the coin. And then I have them write those number sequences or, or heads tail sequences on the blackboard. And I, I explain to them that I and they also, and you will now be able to also do this, am able to distinguish the true randomness from the artificial randomness. Okay, let me show you how. What you see here is a simulated not 100 tosses, but 64, because computer scientists like powers of two, and that's going to be important a little later on. So, out of those 64 sequences, you see that the longest run, which I highlighted for you there, is five tosses of the coin long. Okay. Now, the magical fact is that every time you double the sequence length, the longest run, on average, goes up by one. So if I go from 64 to 128, and then from 128 to 256, I doubled and doubled again. What you see here is, but now the longest sequence really is seven long. And if I double and double again, the longest sequence turns out to be 10 long because it's just on average what I'm telling you. Okay? So back to the story with my students. Unless the student would know this, he'd probably go heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, okay? and wouldn't put in a sequence of the correct length, this longest run. What's the longest run for a sequence of length 10? I told you it goes up by one for every doubling. Let's start counting the doublings. We start by two. We double. So we double once for two, twice for four, three times for eight, four times for 16, five times for 32, six times for 64, and seven times for 128. This means that the student would have to produce, on average, a run of length between six and seven. So you'd have to go heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, 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 tails. And that just doesn't seem random, right? Okay. But unless you knew this, you wouldn't have really any idea of being able to decipher the situation, the fake from the real. Apple ran up against this when they introduced a shuffle option on their iTunes and their iPods way back. So what does shuffle mean? Shuffle means you take albums. So the black album was already taken, the white album was already taken, so I took a blue album, a red album, I took a yellow album, and I shuffled the, content, the contents of those albums in the same way that a dealer would shuffle a deck of cards. And this is what happened. Seems random to us. But to some people, okay, because we as humans are pattern recognition machines, so some people will say, that's not random. In true randomness, you would never have song number three from the blue album follow song number two from the blue album. 
not just once but twice, also song number five from the Blue Album after song number four from the Blue Album. You've got to do a better job of implementing your random shuffle algorithm. But this is really what randomness looks like. It's just that our brains aren't wired to perceive it. So what did Apple do? The customer's always right. So they reprogrammed their shuffle algorithm, and Steve Jobs said, we had to make it less random to make it feel more random. <laughs> Final example of my talk. Imagine taking pretty much any data set you would find out in the wild. The length of the rivers on Earth. Or the street numbers of any city you could think of. Or the numbers on a tax statement. You take those numbers and you chop off everything but the first digit. So for example, the length of the River Nile, 6,650 kilometers. You chop off everything but the first six. You put that in the bag. You take the next river, do the same thing, place that in the bag. I actually did this very thing with um, the Austrian census data, last year's Austrian census data, of uh, 2,100 municipalities, all 2,100 mu municipalities in Austria. So there are large cities with more than 100,000 inhabitants and smaller communities with maybe 350 people. So for the 350, you take the three. For the, one, uh, for the 120,000, you take the one. You place that in the bag, all those numbers, all those digits, you place those in the bag, and you have the computer count. How often you get the one? How often you get the two? How often you get the three? Well, it's random, right? So you'd expect the ones to come up as often as the twos, to come up off, uh, about as often as the threes, and so on. What happens? The ones are almost twice as likely to be in the first So the first position is almost twice as likely to be a one, than a two, than a three. And that's nothing special about the Austrian population. I checked with uh, currency exchange data, from last week's currency exchange data, US dollars versus 166 currencies from around the world. Same pattern, okay? Random variations, same pattern. U.S. Census data, latest data available, data available from 2010, about 40,000 counties in the United States. And just to look at something else, I took the most obscure thing they list there, which is housing density per square mile. What happens with housing density per square mile? Exact same pattern. And it doesn't even matter whether it's per square mile or per square kilometer. Of course, the individual numbers matter and will transform but the overall pattern stays the same. Okay? Slightly different, same pattern. Okay? And actually, this is known as the Benford distribution, and tax authorities around the world know this, and they do, they use this, they do use this to check whether the numbers on tax statements are plausible in this very sense. Okay. So while you still marvel at that, let me come to the conclusion. What you saw today is that randomness is a lot less random than you might have thought. And also, with the gambler's fallacy, if you don't know this, um, you might stand to lose more money than you would otherwise in the casino because your gut feeling might lead you astray. It's even a bit paradoxical, right, um, that there's these patterns in randomness because randomness is like the antithesis of, um, of order and patterns. But as you saw, nevertheless, they're there. And if I hadn't pointed them out to you, you'd probably have to squint pretty hard to make them out yourself. But I sure hope that if you do, you can appreciate how special they are. Thank you.